outside the diocese. We want to welcome each one of you for this special program here this evening. It is great to see so many people on this night where we're going to uh, listen to Father Spitzer and his special presentation that is so unique to his own uh, background and to his own teaching. So I'm, I'm grateful to everyone and to the uh, school's office staff for planning all this as we welcome Father Spitzer here to listen to his exciting program on the scientific evidence of the existence of God. In 10 days, we're all going to be turning the liturgical clock and begin a new season, a new liturgical year, and the season of Advent. A very special time of waiting, of expectation, and of hope as we prepare to celebrate the coming of Jesus. The Advent season is a time of preparation that directs our hearts and minds to celebrate Christ's coming, his coming among us, and his coming at the end of time. Scripture readings during the Advent season tells us not to waste our time with predictions because Advent is not about speculation, but rather we are called to be alert and ready, not weighted down and distracted by the cares of this life. The world today is constantly challenges us to think that there is no reason to prepare ourselves for anything after life because the world says that there is no God or that we don't have a soul or that the only thing that matters is our achievements, our happiness, gathering of material things and accumulation of wealth. It is so unfortunate that these messages seem to be the most prevalent and resonate with the younger generation. Evident by recent few surveys show that the number of people actively associating with a religion is on a steep decline and in particular the young are the most vulnerable. Additional research also shows that the greatest reason for declining religion results from a secular myth misstating the facts. We probably could call it fake news, right? <laughs> but while these statistics are very concerning, we continue to have hope. The fact that all of you are here tonight with us for this evening, for this event, is a clear sign of hope. You wouldn't be here if you were not seeking some clarification, some answer, some better understanding of the mysteries of life and of faith. I hope that we want to learn the truth and to understand why the secular world tries to cover up the truth. I hope that you desire to educate your students or your children with the truth of God's existence and his role in our lives and our world. I hope that you will have a trusted resource to reference when other questions arise about our souls, about true happiness, about the purpose of life and even of suffering. With all of this in mind, 
I am pleased to introduce now our superintendent of schools, Dan Roy, who will introduce our guest speaker tonight. And again, God bless each one of you for being here, and thank you for being here. Dan. introduce our guest of honor. We have a couple of housekeeping items. Everyone should have received a card with a red stripe for your questions, as 30 minutes have been allocated at the end of the lecture for Q&A. At 7.45, CSO personnel will bring baskets to the aisles to collect these cards. Second, you also should have received a survey card for feedback on this evening's event. Note that there are questions for adults and questions for students. You are welcome to complete the survey on the card and drop it into one of the boxes, leaving the auditorium or at the exit doors. Or you can direct your phone's camera on the QR code, which will bring you to the online survey. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. And now on to our guest speaker. Father Robert J. Spitzer is a Jesuit priest, world-renowned philosopher of ontology and science, and the former president of Gonzaga University. He's well known for a lively discussion with Stephen Hawking on the Larry King Live Show in 2010 where he was asked to provide an opposing viewpoint to the claim put forth in Stephen Hawking's controversial work, The Grand Design, that no God is required to explain the creation of the universe. You can find that on YouTube. Father Spitzer has written and published 10 books on faith, science, philosophy, and ethical leadership as well as numerous scholarly articles in journals such as the International Philosophical Quarterly, Philosophy and Science, the Business and Professional Ethics Journal, and the Journal of Ultimate Reality and Meaning. He holds a PhD from Catholic University of America, and his academic specialties include philosophy of science, particularly space-time theory and transcendent implications of contemporary Big Bang cosmology, metaphysics, particularly the theory of time and philosophy of God, and organizational ethics and its relationship to personal and cultural transformation. Father Spitzer is the founder and president of the Magis Center, and he currently appears weekly on EWTN in Father Spitzer's Universe. Please welcome Father Spitzer. Thank you so very much for uh, your kind uh, applause and your uh, attention and being here tonight. I, I really appreciate it. As I say, I'm a praying kind of guy, so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us. The blessing indeed of our universe, <clears throat> the blessing of science, and the blessing too of uh, that loveliness of exploration and the ability to see your hand in it all. The hand that uh, produces such elegance, such beauty, such symmetry, such mathematical precision, yet such freedom. The hand that has created us in this world to be one with you in the next. We ask that we might know this ever more deeply through our efforts tonight and throughout our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Mary, seat of wisdom. Pray for us. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
I apologize ahead of time if I go a little bit too low or a little bit too high. I'm really trying to get in the middle. And so uh, I'll probably fail miserably, but if I do, be indulgent. Um, today I want to just discuss a little bit about science, what it can and cannot do. And then secondly, I would like to talk a little bit about um, the current uh, state of the universe, what people think uh, about it and uh, what physicists think in particular, and then just move into this whole area of um, the implications of God. And there are two major ways in which this occurs. Uh, one of the ways in which implications of God occur, the beginning of the universe, or perhaps the beginning of a multiverse, or a string universe in the higher dimensional space of string theory or perhaps an oscillating universe, bouncing universe, expanding, contracting, etc. We'll talk about it uh, a little bit in a moment, but whatever configuration, those are still hypothetical uh, because we can only observe this particular universe and we can't even get beyond our event horizon in this universe in terms of observational evidence. But nevertheless, those hypo hypotheses are possible and we need to consider them. And look at the implications. Is there still, in the midst of all these hypotheses, the possibility of a beginning? And I would like to say, yes, there's not only a possibility, that there may be a strong likelihood of a beginning. Hold on to that for a moment. The second uh, way, the uh, second approach in which uh, God's um, uh, creative hand comes up is in what we call uh, the fine-tuning for life in the initial conditions of our universe the fine-tuning for life, also in our constants, our universal constants, which I'll be explaining in just a moment. Uh, in in you know, technical terms, it's called the fine-tuning for life in our free parameters. There are various kinds of variables um, you know, that uh, are part of our equations in physics, or various uh, variables um, present at the Big Bang uh, that could have been other than they are. And uh, those variables are within what is called available parameter space that is written into our universe and our universe's uh, uh, laws and conditions. And so we want to take a look at that as well because uh, as we shall see, if, if it looks like you know just a slight variance up or a slight variance down will prohibit any life form from developing in our universe. And when we see that the incredible odds against our low entropy, our so-called arrow of time, when we see the incredible odds uh, against uh, any life form developing in our universe, I mean the incredible odds in favor of convective instability, which would have thrown our universe, you know, out of uh, you know existence. I think at the end of the day, um, you know, you'll see that uh, you know there is some real uh, uh, sensitivity out there. Um, some implications, some strong implications of God, the Creator, indeed, a very intelligent Creator. So let's uh, hang on to that for just a minute. Uh, that's at least the problem. The promise. Uh, let me just start with some statistics about scientists themselves. Um, the scientists, um, for a long time, um, uh, had been at around about 44 percent. Uh, theistic for a long time, and then a variety of, there's somewhere between agnostics and atheists uh, between that. This would have been prior to 2014 when the Pew Survey actually surveyed um, the scientists from the American Association uh, for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, which is a very large, well-represented, comprehensive group of scientific people. Uh, here is the surprising statistic. Uh, that you can see. You, you would think if you looked at the new media out there, the digital media out there, the web media, that um, more people were becoming atheists among the scientific community. No, that is not true. In fact, the scientific community, according to Pew, is decidedly moving in the opposite direction toward belief in God. Let's take a look um, at what the statistics are. Uh, for the overall statistic that they, they, uh, they had, uh, it was 51% of the um, uh, scientists overall were either believers in God or a spiritual higher power beyond our material universe. So uh, one or the other. So that's 51% theistic. 41% uh, are agnostics or atheists. 
hard to say because they didn't differentiate in the survey, which I had find that head scratcher, but they didn't. So I just split it down the middle and said, okay, there's 20.5% agnostics and 20.5% agnostics. I had no other data to go on. Now, they also, interestingly, took a, a look at young scientists. So if you want to look at a trend, right, you start looking at the, the younger scientists, which are you know under 40, under 35 years of age, and you start looking at them, and you can pretty much see where the trend is going. Um, uh, now, if I'm not mistaken, and I, I know it's over 60%, but I'm going to just, it's either 63% or 66% of young scientists, one or the other, um, are theists. That is to say, they believe in God or a spiritual higher power um, uh, beyond our material universe. So if you look at that and you go, wow, that's a super majority. Uh, there's a majority of scientists overall, but younger scientists, uh, the ones under 40, are now looking as if they're a super majority, like two thirds of them are coming in as theists or um, as, you know, believe in spiritual higher power um, beyond the, the material universe. So uh, the trend is not toward atheism among scientists. If the Pew survey of the AAAS is pretty accurate, and why wouldn't it be? They seem to be a very good um, uh, tracking company, polling company, surveying company. Uh, I would suspect uh, they're probably um, right pretty near the, uh, the truth. So that's good news. Um, now the, qu the question, of course, comes up, why? Why are scientists moving in this direction? Now, true, some of them are moving in that direction because they're following their hearts, as many religious people do. I uh, might not have anything to do with science. But they are people of science. And so you have to think to yourself, there's certainly their belief in God cannot be divorced from their scientific practice. But they tend not to be nearly as materialistic as an older generation. That is true. Why is that? Um, well, uh, that comes up in other kinds of things, but we'll see some of that evidence tonight. But I think also uh, there is uh, some really interesting trends uh, that are manifest, uh, and we'll talk about it in other areas, but I can't get into it tonight, except if you want to ask a question, I'd be happy to answer that question. But uh, just doctors, just for the uh, final part of it, uh, I was really shocked when I saw the NIH, um, uh, you know, the uh, National Center for Disease Control, they do a statistical uh, sampling, as well as the healthcare community, uh, rated doctors at 76% who practiced religion or believed in a higher power, you know, that's beyond our, a spiritual higher power beyond our material universe. 76%, so that's even higher than the average of young scientists. And of, among that, 11% were agnostics, <clears throat> they split it out, and 10% were atheists. So I can tell you right now, science, at least on the basis of the belief patterns of the scientists and doctors who are involved in it, is not atheistic. It's just simply not atheistic. By the way, uh, this is not a best kept secret, although uh, a lot of main uh, uh, media outlets did publish it, but you, published it all over the place. Uh, so I ran into it in about five different settings, but uh, people don't seem to know that. Students ought to know. Scientists are not on the whole uh, atheists, if uh, the Pew survey is correct, and I believe they are. So that's my first point. My second point is what could science do and what can't science do? Um, number one, a science can't disprove God. So that is the first thing. Uh, why can't science disprove God methodologically? Why can't it do that? Number one, just three premises, real easy to grasp. Number one, where does scientific data come from? <coughs> Observational evidence. Number two, where can we currently find observational evidence? <coughs> only within our universe. We can't observe anything even beyond the event horizon in our universe, let alone to the full extent of the universe. We can't get out there. There's a whole reason for that, but I'm not going into it tonight to just be merciful to you. 
So the third thing is, is wait a minute. If God is beyond this universe, I mean, after all, that's what it means, right? Infinite power, infinite of our unrestricted uh, mind or infinite unrestricted intelligence. If that's who God is, he is certainly beyond our universe. Indeed, it is ever more likely that this whole universe is merely a thought in God's mind. And if that is the case, then I ask you, how can you use data from within our universe? That's the only kind of observational data we've got. How can you use observational data from within our universe to disprove God who is outside our universe? How can you do this? Answer, it cannot be done. It is completely incongruous with the scientific methodology. It can't be done. It's like a cartoon character assembling all of the data from within the cartoon to disprove the cartoonist. It's incongruent. It can't be done. The second thing that's really important, uh, science is an inductive discipline. Because it comes from all of those observations, and induction just simply means that we're generalizing things, right, from what we see in nature. So when we see various kinds of patterns or cause-effect patterns or something of that nature, right, we begin to generalize about it. We begin to say, you know, this is looking more and more like a repetitive pattern. This looks like a scheme of recurrence. This looks like something uh, that could become what we would say a fashion as an inductive generalized law. And that's how we get our scientific laws. But here is the problem. <clears throat> and you'll see the problem right away. The problem is, if all of that is coming from induction, from looking at observational data, scientists don't know everything in this universe. I can assure you of this. We may not know most of what's in this universe, on the, you know, below the subatomic level, etc. There are just mysteries of every profound sort. So now, what's the problem? Well, if you make a new discovery, that we discover subsequent to now, based on observational evidence, it could change everything. Therefore, we say that scientific knowledge is conditional. Of course, there are certain kinds of scientific truths that you can know to be the case. You can uh, basically know, um, you know that uh, certain kinds of, of electromagnetic behaviors are going to occur in various kinds of very of, you know, constricted dimensions, but you can't say that that's an absolute truth. You can't say that this is going to hold for all time. You can't say that there are uh, un, uh, unknown, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, forces that may affect this uh, going forward into the future. I mean, obviously, we, we don't think, we, we think that an electron is the ground state for all physical processes, and that you're never going to have an electron decay, uh, you know, because it is the ground state. But you could discover something subsequent to now, which could actually show that what you think today is the unthinkable might happen. So what's my point? Well, everything I'm saying tonight, like every other scientific truth that's on the kind of grandiose basis, let's just call it probable. Let's just call it these are generalized laws based on a whole lot of excellent empirical observational data. However, it is subject to change whether we like it or not. Science is inductive, and so we have to allow for that. Some new discovery could be made, and once again, the old theory could be thrown right off the academic stage. Okay, enough said. But uh, those are two cautions as we move forward. But nevertheless, I'm going to state some things because I do think there are probabilistic truths in science. And I think that those probabilistic truths, those good generalizations within the confines of the observational data which they were made, I think that those truths are worth talking about. And by the way, if they weren't worth talking about, you would not have a microwave out of the GQ. <laughs> um, so obviously, they were a lot of those scientific truths work, and we do have a spacecraft that could get to the moon, etc. Okay. 
Third thing, let's just get uh, right into um, you know the you know what, what happened. What, a little bit of history of science for just a second. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it because I don't have a lot of time to spend on it. But here's the main thing that I think we ought to know. For all the way up until, uh, frankly, the time of Father George Lemaitre, or Monsignor George Lemaitre, Monsignor George Lemaitre was uh, obviously a Catholic priest. Uh, he had graduated from MIT. He was a colleague of Einstein's and Hubble's. Uh, he was uh, definitely involved in the theory of relativity, astronomical observation. Up until 1927, we thought that the universe was eternal. Even St. Thomas Aquinas said, I believe in a creation in time because of my faith, but I have no, no evidence whatsoever that God uh, was the creator of the universe from reason, from empirical data, from rational or empirical data. I can't tell. The only way I know that is because I've read it in the Bible. God created the heavens and the earth. And that was, in fact, for, well, 1,000, well, actually more than that, uh, simply was, in fact, for almost 2,000 years, really, because it goes back to about 700 B.C., uh, this belief of the eternity going uh, 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 backward in time. However, in 1927, Father George Lemaitre, and by the way, there, he had other colleagues that were writing about this at the same time. There are several... Um, uh, people, historians who have written about it, but now, today, it is generally acknowledged that Lemaitre, among the four big uh, people who were um, formulating the data um, on uh, general relativity that led to the, uh, uh, to the um, uh, discovery of the Big Bang, that was done by Father George Lemaitre. He was the earliest person to have done that. Now, what's so interesting about Father Lemaitre um, obviously, he was a, a person who was very familiar with general relativity, and uh, he did, he saw, by the way, we have Lemaitre's name everywhere. Lemaitre Walker space-time, the Lemaitre constant, right, uh, Lemaitre equations that, that contend with space-time, uh, you know, and, and uh, the prediction of singularities, et cetera, et cetera. So his name is everywhere. He's not an unknown in cosmology. Uh, most people don't know he's a, he was a Catholic priest for some reason, but, but he was. Now, here's the point that's kind of interesting about uh, Lemaitre, is he solved a, a really huge problem called the recessional velocity of extragalactic nebula. Now, that's a mouthful, but basically it means that galaxies which are further away are traveling faster than galaxies that are closer to us. They're traveling slower relative to us. Now, what that meant, the only way he could do it was to, you know, act as if, you know, that the, the universe were like a balloon, right? And then, you know, all the dots on the balloon, you know, are, you put a lot of dots on the deflated balloon, and those are galaxies, and you kind of blow up the balloon. And therefore, instead of saying that the galaxies further away are traveling faster than the galaxies um, that are closer to us in sort of an empty space, an empty void, he said, no, oh, no, pretend like the space-time field is actually something. Like in general relativity, space-time really is a field. It really interacts with mass energy. It really does this. And so he said, if we assume that Einstein is correct, well, why wouldn't you assume Einstein's correct? Isn't it? So if we assume that, then he said, maybe the space between the galaxies is stretching and growing. That very creative hypothesis that it's not the galaxies traveling in fixed space, but that the space between the galaxies is expanding. That'll allow for what was first called the Lemaitre equation, right? So that the, the, the velocity, right, of the receding bodies is going to be the Lemaitre constant. Now today it's the Hubble constant, much more accurate. The Hubble constant times the distance uh, from the observer. So once you look at that today, right, you could say to yourself, wow, that, that is a terrific discovery, but what it shows is that the universe probably started off like a really teeny point, like a deflated balloon into a teeny point, and then boom, expanded as a whole like a balloon, where everything, the elastic that's on the balloon is stretching and growing and pulling those dots further and further away 
in accordance with the equation, the specifications of the equation that uh, Lemaitre had. Now, I, I'm trying not to overcomplicate this, but the main thing to remember here is this is going to become important in the board of length and in good theory, and it will or proof, uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the main thing is, yeah, that meant that the universe was expanding as a whole. But if the universe, as Lemaitre said, was expanding as a whole, then there has to go back to eventually to a point at which the entirety of that universe, the, all the space-time configurations would be collapsed into a single point, when the balloon would be deflated into a single point. And that point, as he said, would be the day before which there was no yesterday. This would be a beginning. Shocking. Absolutely shocking. Because for all those years, the assumption of eternity, the eternal uh, universe was the only thing that could be assumed from a physical point of view, was suddenly shaken. Now, Einstein was not convinced. He told Lemaitre, right? You know, Lemaitre presented him with the, with, the, with the evidence, and he said, the mathematics is perfect, but the physics is preposterous. Imagine the universe expanding out of a singularity. You know, it was a preposterous idea. And then, of course, uh, Edwin Hubble invited Einstein, remember that famous picture, uh, to Mount Wilson? And, of course, uh, there they were, um, you know, uh, looking at each other. And, and there's Hubble. This is in 1929. He finished his survey of the heavens. And Hubble was over there, you know, sort of pointing somewhere and saying, uh, well, you know, there it is. There's the evidence. I, I think Lemaitre is right. And um, so he did, uh, after a conference at MIT, he told Lemaitre, this is the most uh, um, uh, uh, creative and satisfying explanation of universal creation that I have heard. So it was, it was close to an apology, as you could get. And um, uh, it was very nice of Einstein to do it, because he was a very humble man. Anyway, that's another story. But uh, what's my point? Once that happened, wow, the implications metaphysically are really important, because it might necessitate that there be some kind of a god, some kind of a creator, uh, outside of the whole of physical reality, which at that time, let me turn it up, there's this universe, and that's all there is, there's not anything else, so if, that, if this universe had a beginning in time, then there'd have to be some kind of a metaphysical cause, not only of the universe's expansion, but a metaphysical cause of the universe's existence out of nothing. Now, of course, as you can imagine, because of the import of all these things, Sir Fred Hoyle, who later became a theist, uh, but at the time, Sir Fred Hoyle was not a theist, he was an atheist. And he was a very convinced gadfly atheist. And so, of course, immediately, you know, he came up with various possibilities. Could be a bouncing universe, he said. Could be expanding and then contracting and re-expanding and recontracting. So that was one of the possibilities uh, that was immediately entertained, and rightfully so. What's the job of a scientist? The job of a scientist is to find the natural explanation if there is one. Can't appeal to a supernatural explanation until you've ruled out the natural explanation. So that's a good hypothesis. Possibly that could have happened. Then, of course, um, the, the original Big Bang Theory of Lemaitre, that was transformed in two respects. I'm, I'm going fast. Uh, oh, by the way, the, the uh, Big Bang, that was validated by um, you know, Hubble, uh, Penzias, and Wilson uh, when they discovered the, the um, uh, 2.7 degree Kelvin uh, uniformly distributed radiation in the universe, the remnant, the so-called remnant of the Big Bang. Then, of course, it was uh, also just, you know, verified again and again by the co two Cove satellites, cosmic background explorer satellites, and by the Wilkinson uh, microwave and isotropy probe, pro and by the, the, recently by the Planck satellite. N nobody challenges of the Big Bang, and, and by the way, the age of the universe, very probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 13.8 billion years old, plus or minus 100 million years. So we've got a pretty good idea on this, and honestly, if somebody comes and tells you it's 6,000 years old, it's just, frankly, baloney. It's just baloney. There's really, really excellent evidence for this. Well, what's my point? My point is, though, that now we've got to start considering, is this a real beginning? 
or was there some kind of a reality before the beginning? So our first transformation, we saw, of course, first possibility, oscillating universe, postulated by all kinds of folks, expanding and contracting. The second thing that happened was the discovery of inflationary theory. And I don't want to uh, bore you with all these details, but the infoton field the, the, in, in inflationary theory allows for what we might call possible um, bubble universes. And so, you know, in, in, in this kind of exploding uh, mosaic, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, of, of inflation, you could have all kinds of bubbles, you know, Andre Linde and, um, and a variety of other um, uh, physicists there, right, um, were talking about this, and they basically said, you know, you could have all kinds of bubble universes, and the, the, the uh, inflationary, um, um, you know, uh, producer, the mechanism producing the multiverse, as it were, um, this uh, inflationary uh, infoton field, why, that's like a multiverse. You, you could look at it like that. It's a big mega, mega, mega universe that is coughing out, um, and I, I'm not gonna explain the process here, but you can ask a question about it. It's coughing out little bubble universes all the time, so that there are trillions of, in trillions and trillions upon trillions of bubble universes that are present. So um, um, you can see that that's another feature. So why is that important? Well, just like the oscillating universe, right, that's expanding and contracting, well, they thought, well, maybe you could do that forever. Maybe it's been doing that for an infinite amount of time. Maybe there's no beginning of a, of a, of a bouncing universe. So that was uh, one thing that had to be contended with. And then with the inflationary universe, now we, uh, inflationary theory, we now have a multiverse. And that multiverse, maybe the multiverse could go back uh, infinitely in time, go backward uh, eternally. And if it did, well, there'd be no creation. That multiverse <coughs> has been around for a long, long time. So that's another possibility. And so that the third thing that happened was uh, Another big area is the quantum cosmology. Uh, most of the, one of the quantum cosmologies is string theory and loop quantum gravity. Those are the two uh, right now that are most popular. Um, but anyway, string theory allows for uh, what you might call higher dimensional space, like 11 dimensional space or even more dimensional space than 11, in which very strange things can happen. And the very strange things could be, well, Maybe you could get like two, three-dimensional um, membranes and um, sandwiched between them is a four-dimensional bulk space-time. And every time these membranes are colliding, right, sort of like an oscillating deal going on, uh, but oscillation on steroids, right? <laughs> so every time they collide in four-dimensional bulk space-time, why well, they burp out another universe and another universe and another universe. So you could actually have then this... Um, um, you know, at the pyrotic uh, universe, you could also have string landscape, string theory landscape, uh, you know, models where you combine the multiverse with string theory and get another possibility that might even have some uh, potential for looking at the anthropic principle. So all these postulates are coming out because of quantum gravity and string theory on the one hand and uh, va uh, vacuum uh, or dark uh, energy uh, and, and uh, inflationary uh, 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 theory on the other hand, and then of course the oscillating theory, and uh, it can also be put into higher dimensions. The, the mega, the uh, multiverse can also be put into higher dimensional, uh, higher dimensions. So you think, okay, well that's it. There's so many possibilities. Uh, we should stop talking about a beginning. There just is uh, all of these uh, possibilities out there. So um, one by one, a lot of these possibilities began to fall. I'll get into fine tuning in just a moment. But there are two theories that are really important when you're analyzing you know, whether a multiverse would have to be able to go back infinitely in time. Uh, Sean Carroll certainly had proposed this, and we'll talk about Sean Carroll's internal inflationary infinite multiverse theory in a moment, but hold on to that. Let's just see what happened historically uh, to um, all these possibilities. Well, the first thing that happened, of course, was uh, the idea that there's a preponderance of dark energy. Dark energy, right, is very different from dark matter, you guys. 
So dark energy is like it's like something inside that space-time field that I was just talking about. So that dark energy is actually almost like a repulsive force, right? It's causing the, the space-time to stretch and grow, but it's causing space-time to stretch and grow at an accelerated rate. So uh, essentially, uh, you can see the problem already beginning to develop with the, the oscillating theory, right? If you have 70% dark energy in our universe that's causing things to, to accelerate an expansion, and you've got 25% dark matter and only 5% visible matter, if that's the case, well, maybe the universe is never going to collapse in on itself. Maybe it's just going to keep expanding forever. Certainly, that is a very realistic possibility, but not one that has been proved. But then Sean Carroll himself came along. Sean Carroll is an atheist, uh, but a very um, honest, good, uh, the person, um, you know, in the midst of all this, but Sean Carroll came along and basically he deep sexed the oscillating universe uh, theory in, in, um, in one fell swoop. What, what he noticed, of course, and uh, is it doesn't matter whether you're talking about, you know, what kind of space you're talking about, whether the arrow is not pointing forward or backward, whatever it is. What Sean Carroll noticed is if you uh, have multiple cycles, every time you have another cycle, Every time the universe expands and then contracts, the contraction causes entropy to go up, and the expansion, the secondary expansion, causes it to go up even further. So what he reasoned was, he said, well, you know, if you keep going backwards, then you'd have to have lower and lower and lower entropy going backwards. And finally, he said, if you postulate on that basis, that you have an infinite number of cycles because you're postulating that the universe is an infinite number of years old, you would have infinitely low entropy, which he called infinite fine tuning with no apparent reason. And that, that was it. The oscillating universe, we might be in an oscillating universe, but as Carol correctly said, we're not in an oscillating universe. That's eternal. There is a fine, there is a beginning. And I don't care, by the way, he applied it to the Steinhardt Turok, right, um, the chirotic, the one that I just talked about, the one on steroids, right? Uh, it, it's applied to everything across the board. The oscillating universe is finished. It's finished. There is one um, uh, uh, theory that has been postulated by Roger Penrose called conformal cyclic cosmology. And if you're interested in it, uh, it also can't be eternal. And in fact, it also has two flaws in it. I would be happy to talk about it in the questions. But basically, I, the eternal oscillating universe, gone is gone. All right. So then the second uh, thing that came up, of course, was, well, what about the multiverse? Could the multiverse be infinite? Now, we're talking about here pre-2007, pre-Sean Carroll's, um, the popular Sean Carroll's book on the eternal inflation and the, and the infinite multiverse. Pardon? Ten minutes? Oh my gosh. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, I'm going to go really fast here because I want you to get the point of this. Here's the main point to see is that the multiverse, when you, uh, this is done by a guy named Alexander Malenkin, and there's a proof called the BPG proof. And I'll just tell you right now that Board of Malenkin and Guth proof um, is really, uh, you know, a proof. Um, it was a really, I, I think I, got, I had less time because I, I didn't come to the time of the introduction. I so apologize uh, to all of you. Um, so, uh, but I'm, I'm just gonna go through this. There's a board of Lincoln and Good proof. And what it shows is that in all accelerating cosmologies that um, uh, you're gonna have to have a beginning. And it's a very elegant proof. It's a very good proof, which I'm obviously not going to explain tonight. But Alexander Lincoln used that proof and showed that if you combine that with entropy, uh, even a multiverse, in other words, an inflating condition which is leading to these bubble universes, even a multiverse would have to have a beginning. The inflationary uh, multiverse would have to have a beginning. And then furthermore, entropy, which is again, I'm not going to be able to get this tonight, but just think of entropy as this, right? That in every isolated physical system, right, there's, there's actually a, well, let's just call it order. 
is kind of like a differentiated stable arrangement of things. And that, that order, you need order in order to have what's called spontaneous change. You need order in order to have what they call a net macroscopic flow of, of, um, of, um, of matter and energy. You need order in order for that physical system to do anything. Now here's the law of entropy. Entropy means that over the course of time, every isolated physical system will, macroscopically, to simply get less, will have less and less and less and less order. The order will begin to break down within that system. And as the order is broken down and gets less, then eventually over the course of time, what's going to happen? Well, if it lasted, let's suppose our universe lasted for an infinite amount of time. Uh, how much of, of time would there be? Um, in other words, if we had an infinite amount of time uh, in the universe, and I mean, how much, how much order would, they be, would there be? So if you had an infinite amount of time, well, then all that order would have been used up. And so, of course, our universe would be dead. Dead of, dead of. Okay, enough said. So you put those two things together, and here's Vilenkin's, uh, I'll paraphrase Vilenkin's quote, but I think it should be on the, on the uh, uh, PowerPoints there. It is said that a reasonable argument will convince, uh, that a good argument will convince a reasonable person. And that a proof will convince even an unreasonable one. Well, now that the proof is in place, what proof? The Vortimalinkin and Guth proof that shows that all accelerating cosmic systems have to have a beginning. And also the proof of entropy that every physical system is grinding down, wearing down, going to run out of energy, right? When you put those two things together, uh, Vilenkin says, now that the proof is in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. That is to say, a, a universe that goes backward in time infinitely for e an eternity. There is no escape, he said. They must confront the reality of a beginning. Now that is a remarkable thing indeed. But I want to get to, to three other th uh, uh, things um, you know, in a hurry. But this is, this is still, as we'll see, a very valid thing. Even in light of Sean Carroll's eternal uh, inflationary multiverse, uh, and I'm just going to talk about that very briefly at the end. But right now, right, I, I can just tell you this. You put those two things together, uh, um, the BBG proof, and you put it together with entropy, I think you're going to see that what we have uh, is a need for even a multiverse, even a string universe to have a beginning. And by the way, Portable Lincoln and Guth applied their proof to nucleating universes in higher dimensional space of string theory. They applied it to um, um, you know, a kind of multiverse that comes from uh, inflation, etc. So that's already, we need a beginning of a multiverse. We need a beginning of uh, oscillating universes. We need a beginning of our universe. We're looking at a beginning. There's only one possible exception, and that one possible exception right now, well, not one possible. There's all, only one exception that we can conceive of presently. And the one exception we can conceive of presently is the so-called eternal inflation and the infinite multiverse that it would uh, produce. But is that a coherent scientific theory? As we shall see, it is not. And the lineup of physicists who are after it is pretty significant. So let's just go quickly to fine-tuning, though. I don't want to miss out on this because it's really important. The most important thing uh, is low entropy. So just get this down in your head, that we have exceedingly low entropy in this universe. And it's very easy to make that calculation, which I will not make here for you, but ask a question about it. The main thing is, if you look at it, we, the odds to get, why do you need low entropy? For the universe to do anything. If it's not going to be a dead universe, you've got to have some order in it. And another way of saying you have order in it to do work is low entropy. Now, the entropy in our universe is exceedingly low. And in fact, the odds against it are 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 123 to 1 against. Remember, you need low entropy to get a life form off the ground. You need low energy not for the whole universe to just turn into a vacuum, to just turn into a, a sort of a, a vaporous, 
you know, a thing with a little bit of nothingness in the middle, right? You need that low entropy to get a life form. Now here's the deal. 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 123 to 1. Why that's the same odds as a monkey typing the entire corpus of Shakespeare by random tapping the keys in a single try. In a single try. You come in, you give the monkey sternly an assignment, and of course, you say, you know, type the corpus of Shakespeare. The monkey not having understood the thing, you say, begins to randomly tap, tap the keys. You come back about uh, a year later, and here is Macbeth in perfect folio condition. And Hamlet <laughs> in perfect folio condition. You say, how did this happen? And of course, not by accident. That is the conclusion. Life almost seems, the low entropy in our universe, it almost seems like our universe was very specifically designed for life. Because the low entropy intrinsic to our universe is so, so, so improbable. It's the same as the monkey type in Shakespeare random. Number two, just take a look at, we have these forces in our universe, right? And these four forces, uh, you know, the, the strong nuclear force, the uh, uh, electromagnetic force, the weak force, the gravitational force, which is really space time theory, right? And when we've got these four forces going uh, strongly, uh, notice what, um, that each one has a constant. And without that constant, ladies and gentlemen, being exactly what it is, within a very, very narrow window, higher or lower, you're not going to have any life form in our universe. So the gravitational force has the gravitational constant. The weak force has the weak force constant. The strong nuclear force has strong nuclear force coupling constant. And the electromagnetic force has three constants. The mass of the electron, mass of the proton, mass, I mean, the, the, the electromagnetic charge. Now you take a look at these four uh, 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 forces and their seven constants. Just let's go through uh, uh, really quickly what what is happening here. Yeah, I'm going to have to go a little bit of time. It's just there's no possible way. I'm sorry, I, I did. <laughs> but I, I want to get to the conclusion. It, it'd be a wasted lecture if I didn't get to the conclusion. Right. So anyway, the, the long and the short of it is, um, you've got um, uh, these these constants. And um, the, the numbers for the constants are identical. So let's suppose, for example, that you were going to just raise or lower the weak force constant relative to the gravitational constant, and both of those relative to the cosmological constant. If you raise the gravitational force or weak force constant by only one part in 10 to the 50, that's a decimal point, 49 zeros in a one. That's like a really small fraction, higher or lower than the actual constant values that they have. Do you realize that our universe would have just either been cataclysmically exploding in its expansion, which parenthetically is really bad for life forms. <laughs> <laughs> or, secondly, the entire universe, boom, would have collapsed into a black hole, and of course, right now, be probably pushing toward 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Yeah, the entire universe crushing to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's really small, and that's really bad for life forms. So, the point that I want to get to is pretty clear that we uh, have to have some explanation for it. By the way, you know the odds of this happening? That the, the gravitational force, the weak force constant, and the cosmological constant would have the exact uh, um, uh, force, uh, the exact uh, values that they would have at the Big Bang? Monkey typing it back. <laughs> Honestly, I feel brand new typing the other keys. I mean, the, the parameter space is so incredibly large that's written into the universe for this, and the, yet the actual parameter for life is so incredibly small and fits it straight on. The third thing that, uh, that I'll get to really quickly is um, uh, just another instance of it, and you think you're going to see it. If we vary the, electro, the mass of the electron, the mass of the proton, or the electromagnetic force by only one part in 10 to the 39. One part in 10 to the 39. Then, as you can probably see, um, you've got uh, uh, a real problem here because we would reach, on either side, convective instability. Either every star in our universe would be a blue giant, or every star in our universe would be a red one. Now, if every star in our universe were a blue giant, this would be exceedingly bad for life forms because everything in every galaxy would be incinerated. Bad news. Alternatively, if every star in the universe was a red dwarf, 
everything would be frozen. You mean we avoided complete freezing or you know, burning of every possibility for a life form by one part in 10 to the 39, a decimal point, 38 zeros, and a one higher or lower of those three constants of the Big Bang? Monkey typing Macbeth again. <laughs> and all I'm telling you is, this is bizarre stuff. If you take that strong nuclear force coupling constant, right, Brandon Carter showed way back in 1979, you altered it just 2% higher, there'd be no hydrogen in our universe. And you alter it 10, 2% lower, there'd be no element heavier than hydrogen, the whole periodic table except hydrogen, gonzo. Just like that, on a 2% variation, you get the point. Well, what is the point? The point is there's got to be some explanation besides an accident. I'm going to cut to the chase and get to, you know, there's either the possibility of, of, of a, um, of a uh, multiverse that can do this, or if not the multiverse, I think uh, we're facing, looking at um, uh, a transcendent intelligence that has actually, as Sir Fred Hoyle later put it, monkey with the constants of physics, chemistry, and, and biology, so that there are no blind forces worth speaking about. He claimed that this super calculating super intellect was beyond, for his, from his point of view, beyond the shadow of a doubt. Now, those are the two options. So we're back at that multiverse again. And we're back, uh, you know, truly, maybe, uh, you know, the, the, the multiverse, of course, we, we saw from Board of Lincoln, Good Proof plus the Entropy, looks like it has a beginning. So, of course, at this point, Sean Carroll writes a book. And he says, I think the multiverse is great. But let's, uh, what was the problem with the multiverse before Sean Carroll actually postulated and, uh, what we call infinite multiverse and eternal expansion and eternal inflation? The problem was, all the multiverses that we could conceive of that actually had physical laws would have to have fine tuning in the multiverse's initial conditions and constants. That's the problem. If you give them, right, if it's just not a complete chaotic uh, expansion out of like a, this, you know, inflating mosaic, you know, fractal like inflating mosaic, if you really got physical laws in the multiverse that are similar, commensurate with our own physical laws, forget it you're still going to need fine-tuning in the multiverse, in the initial conditions and the constants of the multiverse, whatever they may be, to get a slow roll of bubble universes so that bubble universes won't come, co collide with one another or even come within close range of one another in a multiverse. You don't want bubble universes to come in close range because the gravitational perturbations would be so horrible. It'd be like blah, 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 shaking <laughs> like a jello, which would be exceedingly bad for the generation of life form. But it's bad. So what's the point? What's the, the key point that uh, we, we've got to get to is the multiverse is not going to be a solution either to a, uh, you know, a, a, an infinite universe or a solution to how we can randomly explain life forms. So there's only one way out. You have to postulate eternal inflation with an infinite multiverse. That's the only way you're going to get out of believing in a, a transcendent um, transphysical, um, intelligent creator. That's the only way down, really. And Sean Carroll wrote a very ingenious uh, uh, hypothesis of it. It was very, very well done. And for a while there, some of the best physicists in the world really subscribed to eternal inflation and the multiverse. But of late, I'm just going to give you three things and I'll wind it up. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I, I'm going over time here, but I want to get to the conclusion. The main thing is, is what began to happen was, uh, first of all, Tom Banks was a really, really important guy in the, the development of what's called quantum cosmology and string theory. He's a very important, he's a Russ Rutgers University, obviously a high, high end physicist. He wrote, uh, he, first of all, he deep sixed the string theory landscape. He, he did it because he said, well, his article was titled, you'll get the pun if you know string theory landscape, 10 to the 500 reasons why the string theory landscape is wrong and violates violently experimental evidence. Oh, okay. Uh, that pretty much says it. And uh, string theory was, you know, poor Leonard Susskind, you know, uh, probably didn't like reading that article. But nevertheless, the point is, is that's gone. And then all of a sudden, now, 
uh, banks starts going on the eternal um, um, uh, inflation that's leading to an infinite multiverse. And he just says, hey, if you believe this theory, then you're going, it, it violates, right, and, and it uh, contradicts um, what's called colon de Lucia uh, tunneling, uh, which is really important to the development of um, quantum gravity and string theory, which the whole inflationary, I mean, the whole eternal inflationary um, um, multiverse is dependent on. So he said, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't violate Coleman de Lucia and at the same time hold to an eternal um, multi uh, internal inflation and an infinite multiverse that's based on that very Coleman de Lucia um, um, uh, set of equations. So what happened? Oh, doubt was cast. Then, two years later, Stephen Hawking and uh, Thomas uh, Herzog, uh, along kind of with tacit consent um, uh, from Stephen Weinberg, as well, in a different um, mode. Um, but uh, Stephen Hawking, really important physicist, and Thomas Herzog is a colleague there in Melbourne. And the two of them get together, and they, this is his last academic paper in the Journal of High Energy Physics. And what does Hawking say? He says, you know, our universe did not come from a fractal explosion of infl inflation. There is just too many contradictions of the experimental evidence. We are not just a random fractal within this uh, mosaic of uh, you know, exponential inflationary explosion. He says, we just can't be. And as a matter of fact, he says, because of that, inflation, get this, cannot be eternal. Now you guys tell me, if it's not eternal, then what do we know about inflation? It has a beginning. Exactly. And all of a sudden he says, oh, by the way, it's not just that um, inflation had a beginning, um, it, that eternal inflation is just not possible. Our universe doesn't correspond to any such theory. He says, they're going to even have to have, um, uh, you know, um, much, you're going to have to have physical laws. So he says, the number of bubble universes is going to be severely restricted. I'll wind it up in one minute. And, and so, when did I want him, right? All right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, last but not least, I'll just tell you, Boltzmann brains. So Hawking really uh, made a huge difference on this thing. But then Boltzmann brains. This has been talked about all the way since uh, Sean Carroll uh, wrote the book. Basically, Boltzmann brains are like your brain, um, fully loaded with memory is going to fluctuate from a thermal fluctuation into existence. And then later, another fellow by the name of Don Page comes along and says, it's not just Boltzmann brains, but it's brief brains. Quantum fluctuations will bring about brains way before our universe will ever be developed, uh, given the, the, the low entropy requirements right, for our universe versus a Boltzmann brain. Now, if you push this logic uh, to its furthest limit, hey, everybody, you Right, are a freakish observer. You are a Boltzmann brain. If you take the infinite uh, eternal inflation really seriously, you have to say that you are basically a brain that fluctuated into existence in a thermal vacuum and with your memories fully loaded that you were in a carbon-based universe that looked like ours, but you're really not. You're just a Boltzmann brain that just vanishes shortly thereafter. And so we're all, we're all completely deceived. Now, uh, I'll just, uh, Raphael uh, Rousseau uh, is a wonderful uh, physicist over there in Berkeley. And he just says, you know, any theory that requires that there is almost a 100%, in other words, there's almost total certainty that you must be a Boltzmann brain or a brief brain uh, fluctuating in and out of existence. And all of this is like a dream or a fantasy. He says, any theory like that should be rejected <laughs> as scientifically untenable. Let's face facts. Well, what happens? The eternal inflation and the infinite multiverse have really been hit hard. If this theory continues and eternal inflation bears out to be really completely unlike our universe, and it turns out to be, uh, you know, uh, violate um, uh, quantum uh, gravity uh, requirements, uh, especially Coleman de Lucia. And if it also turns out to require Boltzmann brains and brief brains that, that every observer in their universe be a Boltzmann brain and brief brain that has deceived themselves completely. If we do that, 
that at the end of the day, we're not doing science anymore. And observational data certainly doesn't mean a darn bit. I think that the eternal inflation theory is going to find its nice end, along with other kinds of theories that have found their nice end in science. And if that is the case, and I think it will be validated, I don't think you can get out of Bolsonaro. You certainly can't get out of Tommy's or Bolsonaro's or Brief Brains. And certainly Stephen Hawking has a looming shadow of restricting the number of bubble universes that can ever come out. I think you've got one basic explanation left. Because we fall right back to Voinkin's, uh, the BBG proof again, that we're going to have to have even a beginning of a multiverse. We're going to have to have a beginning of every uh, bouncing universe. We're going to have to have a beginning of every string universe that's nucleated in the, in the uh, high dimensional space of string theory. We're going to have to have a beginning of our universe. And by the way, if you're going to get out of the requirement that, that, you know, that now you've got a fixed number of bubble universes, now you're going to have to say, how are we going to get out of the fact that the multiverse really has fine-tuning in its initial conditions and constants. All you've done is move the fine-tuning paradox back one step. So if that's the case, all I can tell you is what we're dealing with now is that we're dealing with looking right at a beginning of our universe and right at a very intelligent beginning of our universe. And that intelligent beginning has to be outside of physical space and time. It's got to be outside of our physical space-time asymmetry. And it has to create, if it has a beginning, that physical reality we know of. Whether it be a multiverse, whether it be a universe, whether it be, right, uh, uh, you know, an oscillating universe, whatever it may be, it has a beginning. And it has to have, uh, you know, some explanation, ultimate explanation for its constants and conditions that are so fine-tuned for life, it's unbelievable. If that's the case, all I can tell you is, I think scientific evidence is pointing almost voraciously toward God. Thanks so very, very much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Father. Um, I'm trying to organize all these questions by topic, because a lot of you would ask similar questions, so hopefully you can get to most of these. So the first question we got here, um, it's actually um, about aliens. What is the church's position in the existence of life elsewhere? What is your position? And there were many other variations of that. Do you think aliens are possible, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, okay so in, um, uh, with respect to all of these things, number one, aliens are certainly possible. Uh, number two, the church has nothing against postulating aliens. There are two kinds of uh, ways of talking about alien life form. Um, intelligent alien life forms like us versus non-intelligent uh, alien life forms. Non-intelligent alien life forms, that certainly could happen because it seems like the laws of the universe, as Hoyle you know, thought a long time ago, that the laws of the universe do allow for biological speech of stars to happen in a natural way. So if that happens, and by the way, you have probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to the 22nd exoplanets out there, right? Which resembles the number of stars in our universe. So uh, the number of stars in our universe is 10 to, that's a billion trillion stars. It's a lot of stars, but it's a finite number of stars. But it's so many that if you have all those biophysical uh, you know, uh, formulations, if you've got them going, to be honest with you, there's probably going to be, unless there's some reason um, that we can't uh, have them, it's probably going to be some form of alien life somewhere. At least a lot of people think that. Now, can I prove that? No. All I can tell you is there's a lot of planets like Earth, and there's probably about a billion trillion of them if estimates are correct, and they may be wrong. But so, yeah, is there an alien life form? I think there's an alien life form. Number two, are there intelligent alien life forms like us? Can't be able to explain this today uh, to you because it requires a lot more uh, on, you know, on the level of the soul. But here is the basic thing uh, to notice, is that, you know, if you look at those peer-reviewed medical um, uh, uh, studies and near-death experiences, and you look at the peer-reviewed medical studies in terms of lucidity, I mean, there is a really good probability that you have a transphysical soul that's going to survive your bodily death. 
They're really good ones. The Pim Van Model Study published in the Lancet, right? The uh, uh, Samuel Parnia one that's published in the uh, in the uh, 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 resuscitation uh, journal of resuscitation, right? All these things are really well done uh, peer-reviewed studies. If you don't have a transphysical soul that's going to survive bodily death, why well, I, I would just be completely surprised because you know what? Eighty-one percent of blind people. I know all about blindness. Eighty-one percent of blind people see if they're born from uh, if they're born blind see for the first time when they're clinically dead flat EEG etc so you look at that and you say wow how can that happen if there's not some form of consciousness that survives uh, the body okay what's my point if you look at all the stuff going on with what's called a research into consciousness from um, David Chalmers and, and so forth, Sir John Eccles, et cetera. If you start looking at Gerdel's art, uh, uh, you know, there's a mathematician named Kurt Gettle, et cetera, et cetera, he talks about the mathematical, um, uh, the uniqueness of math, uh, human mathematics. It can't be reduced to physical processes. In other words, the same thing with David Chalmers' consciousness studies. Self-consciousness as we know it can't be reduced to physical processes. And it just goes on and on and on and on. The evidence for a soul is overwhelming. Well, what does that mean? If there are aliens out there who are like us, who have the desire for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being, if there are aliens out there who really do leave their physical bodies and have a transphysical soul, if there really are aliens out there who have self-consciousness just like we do, and they have also um, uh, uh, you know, a mathematical capacities, and, and of course if they're out there traveling to Earth, you bet they have some mathematical capacities that are just like us, can't be reduced to physical processes. They have a soul. Those aliens have a soul. And if they have a soul, it certainly did not come from an evolutionary biophysical process. It had to come from a transphysical cause. What transphysical cause? God sounds pretty good to me. If he's the intelligent creator of the universe, then he can also be the intelligent creator of our soul. And if that's the case, then if God created them, and you spot a bat, uh, uh, an alien, and you talk to him, and he says, you know, I, I desire perfect love, and I desire perfect beauty, and perfect home, perfect uh, truth, etc. And I desire perfect justice and goodness, and by the way, I can do mathematics just like you. I'm self-conscious just like you. And yeah, we do have near-death experiences up in our alien world. First, catechize them. <laughs> and catechize them. Because they are created by the same creator who created you. Good question. Okay, Father, thank you. Um, so the next one, since you touched on the soul, I rearranged the questions. This person wrote, when I was 12 years old, I almost drowned. And I saw the pages of my life flash, flash very quickly by me. I was going down a very bright tunnel, and all of a sudden, a voice called me and said, go back, it's not your time yet. You are needed still. Just then, my father got to me, grabbed my hand, and rescued me. Who was talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, that's of course a matter of interpretation, but I would just say it's not your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is just not that short, but that smart. And uh, how would your subconscious mind suddenly have such acute powers of perception when you're in the midst of the throes of death? Yes, you are conscious. You, you are actually conscious, and you're in the throes of death. Well, that's one clue that it might not be you. And it might be the transphysical cause of the soul that is you. And if that's the case, I'm going to forward a really good guess. That was God. <laughs> and if it wasn't God, it was a messenger of God, like an angel or a deceased relative or friend, which happens occasionally. But if it's just a voice, that's generally what people perceive as either the white light or God. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Okay, so this one. In light of the first law of thermodynamics, which states that energy can be neither created nor destroyed, how does the epiphenomenal view of consciousness, which states that consciousness is the transmission of electrical impulses across neurons, support a view for the immortality of the soul? Thank you, Father. Yeah, I would say that consciousness um, is not um, really an epiphenomenal, um, uh, an epiphenomenon that is produced by uh, electromagnetic activity in the brain. Um, I'm going to go with uh, two people. Uh, the first is David Chalmers uh, over there at um, uh, Oxford. And now I think he's come over to New York University, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but anyway, he's, uh, 
He's got a book that was published by uh, Oxford University Press, uh, and it's, it's called uh, you know, on the, uh, the Reduction of the Mind. And he goes through there and he shows why our view of self-consciousness cannot possibly be explained by electrons alone. What he's trying to say is, okay, I'm, I'm aware of the water bottle, but I'm also aware of my awareness of the water bottle, okay? Now, when I'm aware of my awareness, actually, I could do it triple you. I could be aware of being aware of my awareness. Now, if I did the triple, I've got my own universe. This is really difficult to explain in physical terms. Because you literally, it's like the dog swallowing itself, swallowing itself. I mean, the dog not only comes back and gets its tail, it's got to actually swallow itself and come all the way back as it's swallowing itself and swallow itself again. Meaning it's certainly going faster than the speed of light. In fact, it's going beyond space, time, and symmetry, etc. But anyway, Chalmers goes through. I mean, it's relentless. It's like what? 560 pages of relentless testing of every physical process known to human kind. And he just winds up saying, consciousness is not that. It's not electron activity. Now, you say, well, what function does the brain have? The brain has all kinds of functions. Brain has memory functions. Some protein cell synthesis is going on all the time. <clears throat> neurons are definitely, uh, well, not only neurons, but uh, all the electrons that constitute the neurons, etc., and you know, synapses, etc. All of these things are definitely physical activities that the brain, which is interfaced with consciousness, is explaining. One of the best books you can read on that is called, it is by a fellow, um, two, two philosophers. Sir, well, Sir John Eccles is actually a Nobel Prize winning physiologist, but he also got a PhD in philosophy. I hate people like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so Sir John Eccles, he wrote a book with another guy named Karl Popper, and, and it's called the, the, the Brain, I mean, The Mind and Its Brain. The Mind and Its Brain, or The Self and Its Brain, excuse me, The Self and Its Brain. Read that book. It is a very technical explanation of just exactly what the brain is doing and what consciousness and conscious identity is doing relative to the brain and his theories about uh, mind-brain interaction. Now, I think the best person for, um, uh, for soul and brain interaction, the best person is a physicist by the name of David Bolo. You gotta read that. I mean, he said, oh, the trouble is to write something really high, mighty, high end. And so it might be a hard slog through. But basically, he's saying that quantum processes and quantum collapse is the explanation of what thought can actually collapse what's called a, a quantum information field into what you, you know, call an eigenstate, that's something that can actually do something physically in reality. So um, I think there is a real possibility for this. But um, I guess my long answer to that very, very good question is that um, the brain, I mean, consciousness is not reducible to the brain. Uh, consciousness is far more than the brain, but the brain is involved in how we process through our body, through our speech, through our limbs, through our eyes, how we process uh, the thoughts of consciousness um, into what we call a collapsed state, an eigen state, where physical activities can occur. The brain is that physiological uh, domain. It has its own memories, and, but consciousness has its own memories. When you leave your body, you remember uh, who you are, you remember all the, the things of your past life, but your brain, right, flat EEG, fixed and dilated pupils, no gag response. Basically, you've got a sputterings of a few neurons in the lower brain, and you are in your cerebral cortex that does all the thinking. You're almost done. So. So I mean, essentially, you know, you're, you're almost you're virtually brain dead. So at that point, right, you, you got to say um, the, the con that consciousness is so much more soul plus brain. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> time travel. Just time travel. Yeah. Thoughts on that? Oh, thoughts on time travel. <laughs> Okay, well, here's the, the basic thing. Um, you know, uh, this is a much done error uh, on the part of a lot of very, very good theorists. And that is, you cannot reduce objective time to the measurement of time.
by any clock or clock setting. Like for example, you know, the clock has motion and you can measure time with motion, right? But remember, motion needs objective time in order to occur. Therefore, it, you cannot equate the time which is needed for motion to occur with a motion. That's, that's a, right, a, 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 a regress. That's a bad thing. So the first thing is, is don't think of time as, as, um, as a measurement of time. So for example, let's suppose, by the way, violating the special theory of relativity is, I don't think it's possible. Because the special theory, uh, now there might be a tachyon or something of that nature, that's possible. <coughs> and so, but you're not gonna go back in time, and I'll tell you why in this moment. But let's just take a look at the special theory of relativity equation, radical one minus v squared over c squared. Hey you guys, if v is larger than c, then all of a sudden you got one minus a number greater than one under the radical sign. Uh-oh, negative radical. Have you guys studied those things yet? <laughs> and very bad. Yes, you number no good. So that's the first thing is you've got a problem applying this to the real world of physics. But let's suppose that you could. Let's suppose there's something that we discover in the future that enables us to go faster than the speed of light. Are we going to go back in time? No. What's going to happen is your clock will go backwards. So instead of the pendulum going like that, it goes the other way around, or the particle right, uh, uh, spinning or, or vibrating. And it'll vi vibrate in terms of its anti-particle features, right? So do the opposite of vibratory activity, et cetera, with the electron from the positron or so. So the, the key thing is, yeah, you're gonna have all kinds of backward vibrations and backward time measurement. But that's not going back in time. If you wanna go back in time, you're gonna to have to become Bergsonian. Just wondering what the Bergsonian is. A Bergsonian is uh, from Henri Bergson. And what Bergson said is, look, if you're really talking about going back in time, then you're gonna to have to have, I'm just cutting to the chase, elementary consciousness or elementary memory, right? So something like God, is going to have to remember every past moment in time in its continuity and in what's called its temporal <laughs> extension. He's going to have to remember every single scene throughout the Earth, or every single scene throughout the entire universe, in every 10 to the minus 42nd of a second in a uh, segment, right? So every quantum perturbation in time, that's called that, that flight minimum, every 10 to the minus 42nd second, God gets the next scene, and God gets in. Could God do that? Absolutely! No problem for God. He's timeless anyway. He can integrate all of it in timeless. Not a problem. However, it's not going to be traveling faster than the speed of light that will get you back into the past. You're going to have to actually go back into another thought, a previous thought in the mind of God. And God could say, I'm going to let you change that or just be an observer. But it's God dependent. It's not physics dependent. We cannot move ourselves back into another reality of the past. That would have to be retained by some transphysical cause, which is higher, not only um, than um, the events, but higher than the physical time that separated the events, a timeless reality like that. That's the short answer. <laughs> I wrote a whole dissertation on that, by the way. Um, you know, on objective time here. Okay, Father. Um, she writes, Today, we don't understand creation, there must be a God. 500 years ago, we don't understand gravity, the world must be flat. How is not understanding proof there is a God? Yeah, um, well, there's a really big difference between not understanding, good question, there's a really good, uh, big difference between not understanding something versus having a whole lot of evidence that what we think it is, is not it. So we do understand some things. We do have a pretty good notion of, of uh, what we would call nuclear uh, physics and uh, electromagnetism, and we have a pretty good uh, you know, uh, grasp on uh, gravity. Yes, of course, modifications can be made, but because we're ignorant about whether something can be modified, doesn't mean that we don't understand it somewhat. It just means that we don't understand it completely. So the leap from ignorance to a speculation, that's one thing. But 
what, we're not leaping from ignorance to speculation. We actually do know quite a bit, as I said. It's nice that our microwaves work. It's nice that, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the space, uh, the, the land craft did hit the moon or whatever kind of thing, got there and so forth. So it's very nice that it happened because it's something we knew, not something that we were surely ignorant of. But nobody is, uh, is saying we completely understand what we are trying to do and what's worth doing because we are knowing creatures, right? Should, should Sean Carroll not have written his book? Of course Sean Carroll should write his book. Should uh, Stephen Hawking and, and um, Tom Banks not respond, uh, uh, you know, or the Boltzmann, you know, uh, you know, brains of, of uh, Roger Penrose, should that have not been written to respond to? Of course they should. But as Plato said a long time ago, in the dialectic of thought, in the, you know, the give and the take, we're getting more and more refined idea of something. We're not actually going blindly into our intellectual pursuit. We are refining every time we test a theory, every time we reject a theory, every time we accept a theory and then uh, reject some part of the theory, every time we modify a theory, we're getting more and more and more refined. Does that mean we've got to the absolute answer? No. We can't, we don't know on the basis of science an absolute answer. Could you get to an absolute answer in metaphysics? I maintain you can get to an absolute answer in metaphysics. There are real modern proofs for the existence of God that can really do that. I've written one in this book. I have uh, new proofs for the existence of God. Uh, you can see that somewhere in my briefcase. But anyway, um, there's a, uh, that book. And also there's a, um, Bernard Lonergan's book called Insight, a fine book in philosophy of science. I might point out it's called Insight, the Study of Human Understanding. Read chapter 19, this proof of the existence of God. That's a really good metaphysical kind of proof. I think there are all kinds of really good ones that have been produced out there. And so I think you could do it in metaphysics. You can't do it in science. But you can combine metaphysical evidence with scientific evidence. And that gives you a pretty full picture of you know, the refining and the winnowing of our knowledge. I think in science we're getting closer and closer to a beginning. And we're getting closer and closer not only to a beginning, but to an intelligent uh, creator of that beginning and the creator of, of physical reality out of nothing. I think we're getting there. I think metaphysics can prove that straight out. And I have, a, as I said, perfectly good proof on the basis of metaphysics um, that's in that book, Proofs for the Existence of God. And by the way, you could also go to um, uh, uh, CredibleCatholic.com and just click on volume one and read those philosophical proofs. Okay, the, the main thing is, if you get there, I think we're getting somewhere. We're getting to this mutually reinforcing view that we are not alone, not simply because there's aliens out there. We're not alone because there's a creator beyond all of physics. There needs to be a creator beyond all of physics. And, and uh, I'll tell you something, if we really get to the point where we're showing strongly that there has to be a beginning of physical reality itself, whether it be in a, in a you know, multiverse, or whether it be in a, in a, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, an oscillating universe or a string universe, it doesn't matter. If we get to the point, and we're getting there, where we think that there's a beginning of physical reality, and we think that there is all other explanations for the uh, fine tuning for life uh, beyond the, the, um, the intelligent, um, a transcendent intelligence explanation, if we get to the point where we're really, really close, then the one thing to remember is this. You're touching literally upon a creator. Can't be absolutely certain. Can't be absolutely certain about anything in science. But we're getting really close. We're getting refined dialectical certitude about the existence of such a creator. And I'll tell you one thing. If you really had a beginning like that, you know what physical reality would have been before the beginning? It would have been nothing. Now, I know one thing about nothing. There's no such thing as nothing, because it's nothing. <laughs> and the other thing I know about nothing is that nothing can only do nothing, because it's nothing. So I know two things about nothing. I also know some negative things about nothing. Nothing is not a low energy state in a quantum field. Nothing <clears throat> is not a vacuum in a spatial continuum. Why? Because, of course, I can have more or less space 
more, I mean, you know, more or less vacuum in a spatial field. I can't have more or less of nothing because it's nothing. There's no such thing as it. That's what it means to be nothing. Now here's the paradox. If all of physical reality prior to the beginning was nothing, whether it be a multiverse or universe, whatever you wish, if it really was nothing, then it could have never, physical reality could have never moved itself from nothing to something. Because when it was nothing, the only thing it could do is nothing. <laughs> Therefore, it couldn't have moved itself. So something else had to do it. And the something else corresponds with the, 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 the God I was just talking about, which can be shown in a metaphysical proof in many different uh, good logical words that are out there contemporaneously. So that's uh, uh, the answer in, 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 in a nutshell, as best I can, uh, I can say. There are a lot of really good questions that have been given a signal. Um, so I'm going to give one more question. I did by Democratic. This is the, the next highest number of questions without evolution. So the other okay. questions I didn't give you, I'm so sorry, but there are only one or two of them there. So evolution, um, just there was a lot of different questions about it, the four good arguments against it. What is your opinion of theistic evolution, et cetera? So I guess just general thoughts yeah. on evolution. Theistic evolution is uh, really, uh, that's where I stand. I think, as I said, you know, if you look at the young um, scientists today, you know, I think it might be 63 percent, 63 percent of our young scientists are theists. They're believers in God. They have to believe in some form of theistic evolution because they very much believe in the evolution of physical processes. And the reason they do is because there's a lot of evidence for it. So me, I believe that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. I think within that scope, I think our universe is 4.6 billion years old. Although there could be planets that are much older than our planet in other kinds of galaxies with other kinds of stars. Certainly possible. I think life forms on the Earth, uh, this would be more or less a uh, single cell, protozoa, uh, right, flagellum, amoeba, whatever. Uh, uh, you, you could probably get, get trace them back, back to about 3.7 billion years ago. And I think the evolutionary process continues in a very orderly way. I think uh, you know that um, we also are physical bodies, but not our souls. No soul can evolve in a uh, biophysical process because a soul is transphysical. It's going to have to be created by God. But our bodies. Oh, I think our bodies could have definitely evolved from previous hominids. Uh, I think, uh, for example, um, certainly Homo habilis, Homo erectus. I think there's really good evidence that uh, it seems like there might be a link up. Certainly, uh, we, we didn't go through the Homo sapien Neanderthal lenses period, but we did move to Homo sapiens as a generic category and then to Homo sapiens sapiens. Yeah, I do think that happened. I think we do have a genetic biological first ancestor. I think that biological genetic first ancestor, uh, well, our woman, uh, our mother, first mother is mitochondrial Eve. I think she lived about 200,000 years ago. Um, I think uh, we have a male first ancestor uh, who we call Y chromosome Adam. I think he lived about 200,000 years ago. I think that both of them lived on the border of Angola and Namibia 200,000 years ago. Do I think that they had a soul? I doubt it, but how could I possibly prove it? At that time, I don't think they had a soul. Because for 130,000 years, our uh, genetic ancestors were basically, you know, beating down coconuts and uh, eating bananas and not going anywhere, not doing anything. Then suddenly, 70,000 years ago, I mean, figure this out. 70,000 years ago, we turned from, you know, kind of sitting on the border eating coconuts and bananas, beings. We all of a sudden, we start migrating. This incredible migration. We go zooming up to the upper coast of Africa. Then all of a sudden, we go across Asia. And, and then we go down to Indonesia. And then we go all the way to Europe. And then we go all the northern point of Europe. Across the Arctic land bridge into uh, basically Alaska. Come all the way down. Uh, the Arctic, uh, on the, uh, the, the Western Hemisphere, come all the way down um, into the uh, southernmost tip of, uh, of South America. And what? We did that in about 20,000 years. <laughs> How did that happen? Oh, by the way, we never buried our dead with trinkets and things for an eternal journey. Neanderthals bury their dead, but they don't bury their dead. 
with things that indicate you know, trinkets like a divine trinkets and protection and, and you know journey you know food so you know, weapons for the journey in the afterlife where in the world suddenly you know uh, we come into the, this period of 70,000 years ago and every burial site is filled with religious items and things for the journey I mean we now have homo religiosus right there and then uh, on top of that, homo mathematicus. Because right at that point, what do we see? We see carved sticks and rocks that are obviously used as counting uh, stones and counting sticks and things of that nature, progressing into a kind of elementary abacus and so forth. All of a sudden, 7,000 years ago, we're already measuring out and doing, you know, crude, crude, uh, um, um, uh, you know, equations, geometrical equations to plan out ge uh, geographical sites on which to build the village with the center uh, in, in the village. We also see a most important, this is a really important book uh, by two guys, um, Noam Chomsky, who is a, probably the foremost linguistic philosopher uh, uh, in, in the United States today, and another guy named David Berwick. And they wrote a book that I just published in MIT Press, I think about three years ago, called Why Only Us? you got to read this book. Basically, we're the only, only creatures on this earth that have any kind of linguistic syntax at all. Nim Chimsky, the most highly trained chimp we have, named that we know Chomsky, obviously. Nim Chimsky, can, he can learn 120 separate perceptual words in American Sign Language. So he can say, you know, I say bottle, and I get the American Sign Language for bottle. I get banana, and I get the American Sign Language for banana. And he can do 120 of those associations. Pretty good. That's a fairly well-developed frontal cortex. But he can't even distinguish what a, a, a human being a year and a half old can do. Differentiate between dog bites man and man bites dog. And the reason he can't is because he doesn't have a single conceptual idea that can be turned into a predicate, a direct object, or an indirect object. Old Nim is powerless with conceptual language, abstract language about knowledge. Nim is not going to generate an encyclopedia. Nim is going to be content with the banana. Now here's the deal. If that's the case, then we've got suddenly, 70,000 years ago, just like that, we've got homo linguisticus, homo religiosus, homo mathematicus, homo geographicus, homo symbolicus, right? I mean, homo aestheticus, right? But suddenly the interest in beauty and painting and, and bone flutes and jewelry and all kinds of things, we become so interested in beauty and the aesthetic. Chips don't have any interest in this, playing flutes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The point, of course, is you get the point. The point is something really transcendentally weird happening 7,000 years ago. And I would call it that's when our genetic ancestors received a soul. And when they received that soul, they became categorically different. And that's why you and I are. Thanks so much for your kind attention. I believe everybody.